Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome, welcome to the 2021 MSU Age Alive Forum. We are thrilled to have you here. We're thrilled that over 170 people have registered for this event. So I wish you could all look around and see each other, um, but we're glad you're here. My name is Claire Luz and I am a gerontologist on faculty in the College of Osteopathic Medicine at Michigan State University. I'm also the director of Age Alive and I'm your host for the next couple of hours. And I am going to introduce our keynote speaker in just a few moments. But first, a few words on Age Alive and several helpful hints to hopefully make your experience here this afternoon as good as it can be. So Age Alive uh, grew from the grassroots efforts of a lot of people committed to establishing a program on campus that could catalog and connect all research and teaching and community outreach related to aging. And in 2016, the College of Osteopathic Medicine gave us an institutional home and we have continued to thrive ever since. We are committed to well being for all people of all ages. We're also committed to community campus partnerships, intergenerational relationships, and opportunities for engagement in meaningful life enriching activities and lives. These values have been reflected in our efforts to have MSU designated as an age friendly university, which is an international mark of distinction and our work to explore with others across campus the possibility of establishing a campus-wide lifelong learning program. They are also reflected in our partnership with the East Lansing Primetime Seniors Program the MSU, and the MSU Social Science Scholars Program to establish a Senior Ambassadors Program and the really popular Town and Gown Lecture Series. And they are reflected in the beautiful paper, flower, and butterfly gardens that you may have seen around town. There is one currently at the MSU Federal Credit Union. I encourage you to go see it. It's beautiful. And it's um, going to be there through April 30th. And many, many other initiatives I wish I had time to tell you about. Uh, but I don't. So I encourage you to learn more about Age Alive by visiting our website at www.agealive.org or emailing us at agealive at msu.edu. This is our third annual forum. It would have been our fourth had we not had to cancel last year's due to COVID. But this year's theme is lifelong well being. And we have a terrific lineup for you. And I would like to take a minute to thank those who have made it possible. So many, many thanks to the Age of Life Leadership Council, our wonderful Leadership Council, the Forum Planning Committee, and the MSU Alumni Office, especially Amy Carnahan and Devante Kennedy. Devante and Amy are behind the scenes right now, um, providing invaluable technical assistance to make sure that all of this goes smoothly, which I'm sure it will. But if we have little glitches, I'm trusting you to be forgiving because it's the first time that we have had a forum using this format. So a few tips to make this even more smooth. A reminder that this is set up so that only the presenters can be seen on camera and heard. We will have a Q&A period following Dr. Anderson's presentation. Um, and again, after the research panel, during which you are invited to submit questions using the Zoom Q&A function, which I just learned is different than the chat feature. But you should have an icon for both of those on your screen. If you have other items besides questions to communicate to us, you can use the chat function. So we hope that you can attend both segments of this forum. There are two segments. The first is the keynote segment, and it will end at 4 p.m. It will be followed by a 15 minute intermission after which we will start the research panel. And that will start promptly at 4.15. There's no need to leave the Zoom call. The Zoom number is the same for both segments. 
So we hope you'll stay on and enjoy that part of the presentation as well. Um, and finally, we encourage you to take a couple of minutes at the end following the event to complete an evaluation that will automatically pop up. So now without further delay, I have the honor of introducing our keynote legacy speaker today, Dr. William Anderson. And Dr. Anderson has long been a leader in the osteopathic profession, serving as the president of the American Osteopathic Foundation, the Michigan Osteopathic Association, the Wayne County Osteopathic Medical Association, and he has served on the American Osteopathic Association President's Advisory Council for many years. He is currently a member of the Board of Directors of the American Osteopathic Association, a professor of surgical services, and the senior advisor to the Dean of the MSU College of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, Dr. Anderson has led a very long, successful, storied life. I can't wait to hear his stories. He began his professional career in medicine and surgery in Albany, Georgia, where he practiced as a family physician for six years. And during that time, he was the co-founder, he was the founder and first president of the Albany Civil Rights Movement, which spearheaded the movement in Southwest Georgia, working very closely with Dr. Martin Luther King, Reverend Ralph David Abernathy, Mrs. Rosa Parks, and others to advance not only the health, but also the general well being of all of the residents of his Albany community. Dr. Anderson was married to the late Norma Dixon of Atlanta, who was also a civil rights leader. Together, they published a book in 2004 titled Autobiographies of a Black Couple of the Greatest Generation, and I highly recommend it. It's, it gives a terrific behind the scenes and intimate look at the civil rights movement in America. And a, a bonus, it, all of the proceeds go to fund the American Osteopathic Foundation's minority scholarships. Dr. Anderson is the proud father of five children, three of whom have followed him into careers in osteopathic medicine. He also has a daughter who's a librarian and a daughter who is a project training leader of professional development for the state of Georgia and a professor at Kennesaw State University. Four grandchildren are in the medical field and Dr. Anderson is also the proud great grandfather of three. He has received 12 honorary degrees. He lectures at many colleges and universities related to the practice of osteopathic medicine and also civil rights. At Michigan State University, the Slavery to Freedom Lecture Series, which is now named after Dr. Anderson, has been held annually for 21 years now. So today, it is our privilege to have Dr. Anderson tell us more about his life and his legacy. He will speak for about 25 minutes, 20, 25 minutes, after which we will have about 15 minutes for discussion and questions. But you are welcome to submit your questions at any time throughout the presentation, again, using the Zoom Q&A feature. So now, Dr. Anderson, please join us on camera. There you are. It is a joy to have you here with us. And I am gonna sign off, I'm gonna disappear for now. I will pop back up during the Q&A period, but for now, the stage is all yours. Uh, thank you, and I think I perhaps, uh, to avoid what may be considered an indictment on some who are a part of this organization, let me make that apology up front. I walk around the campus at Michigan State and I tell people on occasion, I am the oldest, got that? The oldest member of faculty and staff living and active on the campus at Michigan State University, specifically in the College of Osteopathic Medicine that I had the privilege of being um, one of the original members of the clinical faculty for the College of Osteopathic Medicine, and I shall be eternally grateful 
to Michigan State University, giving many of us the opportunity to fulfill our dreams of becoming a physician, if that is where we want to go. I also perhaps should admonish you, and no, I don't think maybe admonish is the word that I want. <laughs> How about warn you? I am going to warn you that you will be listening to a person who is a liberal Democrat I'm not apologizing for it. I'm just making these statements so that you'll know from which I come. I am pro-choice, have been for many, many, many years, and some will accept that and like that and others will not. I'm a member of ACLU. I'm sure all of you have heard of ACLU. I have been an active dues-paying member for many, many years. I am anti most wars. Listen, wait, wait, wait a minute. How can you talk about you all? You are anti most wars and you volunteered to fight in World War II. Yes, I do believe that there is a time when warring may be the only option. And in my case, I thought that my only option to protect my home and my family was to join the military. Now, for those of you who do not know, I wanted to become an Air Force pilot, but no black could join the regular Air Force. So the Tuskegee Airmen were founded, I will say, just prior to World War II, and a black could become an Air Force pilot at the Tuskegee Airmen. They still exist, by the way. Matter of fact, uh, one of my daughters is the physician for Tuskegee University where the Tuskegee Airmen yet have an airstrip. They have a hangar there, and many of them congregate there on a regular basis. So although I wanted to be one of those Tuskegee Airmen, they said I was too young. My mother told them I was too young. Well, I was 15, and that was when I had my greatest ambition and desires to become a member of the Air Force and fight in World War II. So also, let me say finally, in case some would like to leave because their probation officers said they should not be affiliated with convicted felons. I am a convicted felon. Yes, I was part of mass demonstrations in Albany, Georgia. It was called the Albany, Georgia Civil Rights Movement. Yes, I was one of the founders of that organization. Yes, I went to jail with those who were in that organization, I'm, I'm proud to say. And yes, many of us <laughs> not only were arrested, but we also were charged, we were convicted. And fortunately, we had friends in the White House at the time because the Kennedy family was there. The father, not the father, the older brother and the younger brother were in positions where they could be of assistance to us because they too felt that there were values to be found in many blacks in the United States. So then when I was charged, initially tried in Albany, Georgia, and would have been sent to jail right then and there for 20 years as a member of an organization that was threatening to overthrow the government. And you may say, did you do something like that? Yes, I must confess, I was part of an insurrection, not like the one on January the 6th of this year. No, 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 no. This was a different one. This was a peaceful demonstration in Albany, Georgia, that was protesting the denial of the right of the city to permit blacks to register and vote. And that's how I wound up getting to be a member of that organization that became known as the Albany Civil Rights Movement. And yes, many of us were con 
convicted and I went to court in Albany, Georgia, where the judge who is dead now, I can call his name, J. Robert Elliott, but yes, and there was an all white, all male jury. So what chance did I think I had? Now, mind you, I, I, I only had 30 minutes, so I'm going to skip over a lot, but just let me let you know, I came that close to being sentenced to 20 years in a federal penitentiary, except there was one member of that jury, a white man in a racist society, brought up in a discriminatory environment where blacks were excluded from practically everything of value. But that one man said, wait a minute, I can't send that man away. I had been practicing family medicine in Albany, Georgia for five years at the time. He said, I can't send that man away to jail for 20 years with the service that he is providing for this community, taking care of many of my employees, actually. So he hung the jury. One person hung the jury. Well, that gave me some relief for a little while. However, the prosecuting attorney says, well, this will not be the end. I will bring it back. And they did bring it back, except that this time it was the Kennedys, Bobby Kennedy and his son, who said, we will transfer that case to Michigan because Anderson now is not in family practice in Albany, Georgia. He is now a resident in surgery in Detroit. And let me interject. At this point, there'll be a lot of stuff to interject. So this might take about a few weeks. But in Michigan, I had to go and stand in a trial again. And this time it was in Detroit and the judge heard the case and he said, I am ready to pronounce sentence. Well, let me say something else. Uh, I, I, I want you to remember whether you believe it or not, there is such a thing as a beginning and an end to everything. <laughs> the beginning and the end of everything. Well, the case was presented before this judge, a federal court judge, and uh, this is in the records, by the way. And, and they're cutting my grass, it sounds like. I hope they stop it pretty soon. But after the uh, judge heard the charges against me, and he says, I am ready to pronounce sentence. I have heard enough from this Dr. Anderson, who was involved in an insurrection in Albany, Georgia, and I'm ready to pronounce sentence. And I got up and said, wait a minute, Your Honor, I have not had a chance to say anything. And the judge said, sit down and shut up. Got that? When you're in a court, especially federal court, and the judge says, sit down and shut up, you sit down and shut up. And I did. But I said, Judge, I have met, I don't want, he said, I don't want to hear any more. I know as much about this case as I want to know. Well, as a matter of fact, Albany, Georgia had been the focal point of the civil rights movement in the United States at that time. So, yes. Everyone who read the newspapers, whether it be the New York paper or the Chicago or Atlanta paper, they had read about Anderson leading these people in Albany, Georgia into an act of insurrection to take over the city, the state, and ultimately the United States. So the judge told me, sit down and shut up, and I did. He says, I am going to sentence you to 20 years in a federal penitentiary at hard labor. I died. Now, for those of you who do not believe in birth, 
death and the resurrection, let me explain it to you. There is such a thing. You know I was born, obviously I was born and probably caused a lot of trouble when I was growing up because of my ambitions. But then I died when I was sentenced to 20 years in the federal penitentiary. I said, Jay, I can't, I can't do that. Well, Judge, do the best you can. Well, then he, he paused and he said, however, that is a word that I will forever remember. However, I'm sentencing you to 20 years in the federal penitentiary. However, well, I want to know what the however is. I heard the 20 years. However, I'm going to suspend that sentence and place you on probation. That was 50 years ago. Two weeks ago, I finally got a letter coming from the federal judicial system where I had been exonerated. I am no longer a fugitive from the law subjected to serving that 20 years. There's more to that, but I want to go a little bit further. I have been asked on several occasions why it is I continue to do what I do. I had a good practice in Georgia. I had, a, I was the first black osteopathic resident in surgery in Detroit and only the third in the entire profession. And that's another story. And of course, we'll have to take a week or two to give you the entire story, but let it be known that I was uh, motivated now that I've had the opportunity to practice medicine, raise a little money, get married to a magnificent woman, getting to know Rosa Parks and become her physician, getting to know Rep. David Abernathy. He and I were classmates in uh, Alabama at Alabama State College for Negroes. And that was what was written on the side of the bus. But not only what did I get to know Abernathy there and Rosa Parks there, but Martin Luther King, who was going on to become a minister, PhD, he finished Crozier Theological Seminary, Boston University. And where was he called to pastor? Montgomery, Alabama, where I was. At what church? Be Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, where I belonged. So I'm saying that these things happen even though we could not have planned it. These things happened and it is up to us as individuals to take full advantage of the opportunities that we have, not just to help ourselves, but to help many others. So, since the judge said, I do not have to serve that 20 years right now, he says, I'll suspend that sentence. Then I look back on what am I going to do now? I have finished a residency in surgery, great practice great leaders in the Department of Surgery, many of whom are deceased now, Don Raddy, good friend. And for those who think that all white people in positions of leadership are against blacks, that's not so. There are many that are willing to help those that are willing to help themselves and to help others. So I said to myself, I had the opportunity to practice surgery in Detroit, the first black osteopathic surgeon. And I say, I also have been given the opportunity to help that next generation. So what did I do? I reached back first to my children. Two of my sons became DOs and two of my granddaughters became DOs. One of them is in osteopathic school now. And I have let them know that we have a commitment. If we have the opportunity to be successful in business, in industry, in medicine, then we have an opportunity to give back to the community from which we came. And let me interject also. And, and, and Claire 
you can shut me up when my time runs out. But I got to tell this because there was a group out of Oregon. And for those of you who have been to Oregon, there are no black people in Oregon. I may have, you know, two or three, but not a significant number. But I'm saying the leadership in the Australian profession in the state of Oregon saw what my commitment was after I had finished my residency and I had a good practice going. My commitment was to the next generation. And so I started through the American Osteopathic Foundation, a minority scholarship fund, because I said, I want to see other African Americans have the opportunities that a number of people had given me throughout the years. And there's another whole story about my civil rights activity. But just let me mention that that is the reason why I established the Minority Scholarship Fund. And it was rewarding to me because in addition to the little money I was able to direct to the Minority Scholarship Fund, the Origin Foundation with the Oregon Osteopathic Association, led by two who have become my friends in this state that has a few osteopathic positions and even a few blacks, donated a million two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to that scholarship fund because they said Anderson he'd done pretty well for himself seven osteopathic positions in his immediate family and he's out here beating the bushes getting people to help that next generation to get the education that they desire they need and they're motivated to have and so I had to remind myself every once in a while that here we were 150 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, 70 years after the Brown versus Board of Education that had to go all the way through the courts before we could get some consideration. 54 years after desegregation of interstate transportation, and incidentally, I want you to know that my late wife was one of those who sat in at a bus station in Albany in the white waiting room waiting to be arrested. And she was, along with several other black females, they too were intimately involved. 40 years after the assassination, well now it's about 50 years after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., we still are waiting for this country to live by this creed that all men and women are created equal. They all should have the opportunities of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, we are still searching for that dream. And Claire, you'll have to just tell me when to shut up. Because I want you to know that even being in jail, you can learn something, you can do something different, you can build something. It does not have to be the end of the life. Yes, there are over 4,000 blacks in jail today a number of them were friends of mine and still are. And they're there not because they did some criminal act that resulted in them being serviced, being, they being de deliberately incarcerated for many, many years, but they also can continue to give back to the community if given the opportunity. But most of the blacks that are in jail now, they are high school dropouts. They were not given the encouragement to get the education that would keep them out of trouble. They are illiterate. They were unemployed. They come from a broken home. They are either black or Hispanics. We are called blacks or colored or blacks and others than white. 
They are a product of a poor environment where drugs prevail. And the education is very, very limited, if at all. So do I consider myself fortunate in that not only did I get my medical degree and had a great practice, but there are many others who have followed now because they had the determination to go beyond what was apparent. That is, I'm in a segregated environment where I do not have any opportunity to become anything. Yes, the opportunities out there, sometimes you have to look for them. So let me just say and pause here about my children that have become doctors. I'm proud of them, oh yes. My grandchildren, I'm even proud of them. Matter of fact, one of my grandsons is head of robotic urological surgery at Detroit Medical Center. One of my granddaughters was an internist teaching medical students and residents in internal medicine at Detroit Medical Center. Another one of my OB Gen sons is in Las Vegas and an OB Gen son practicing, was practicing here in the Detroit area. And when he got so old that he was going to retire from practice, he got on the clinical faculty. So I'm saying that I did not say this is what you need to do, should do, could do. No, they looked at me and said, you know, daddy did all of that with his limited abilities and skills and knowledge, limited opportunities. But he said, even though I might have those limitations, I still will find a way to get around segregation and discrimination and help that next generation to do better. So we can complain, yes. We can avoid those places where segregation is yet in existence in public places. We have a limited number of black doctors in the entire United States. And we have over a million Blacks and Hispanics who yet are in need of the opportunity to get the education and to get a position. I'm going to stop there, even though I do not see the hand being raised now, but I expect it will be. I want to express my appreciation for the members of this organization that is setting an example that we can follow where to we will have the opportunity to make it better for the next generation. So I'm going to stop there and entertain any questions that you may have. Claire, I pause. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. That was wonderful. Um, and I, I'm pleased, so pleased um, to open it up to questions now. And I see a couple of rolling in and I'm gonna uh, be uh, the host here and let you know what these questions are. Before the first one comes in, it's not quite in yet, but before it comes in, I have a question for you. Uh, what has inspired you, what or who, what keeps you going? What has inspired you throughout life to keep on going even, or especially in tough times? I wish I knew the answer to that. And I knew, and I also, I wish that I knew a way to package that motivation and pass it on to others. But the best that I can do is to be an example for that next generation. Remember I said, I came from a small town in America's Georgia, where I could not go in the front door of a theater after paying the 25 cents. I could not go into a restaurant and sit down and have a hamburger. If you don't believe it, you read the history about 
desegregation of a lot of towns where no, we could not get service in a drugstore that had a counter where you get a hot dog. I was limited in the opportunities that I had to go to school. There was no such thing as a pre-K. So you start school at the first grade. So you miss a lot of preparation to go to school. Number one, we only had 11 grades. That is, we had no 12th grade. So if we have no pre-K and have no 12th grade, we already have missed out on two years of education that were very important. We had no orchestra where we could learn music at high school or elementary school. So I'm saying notwithstanding these apparent obstacles or lack of opportunities to advance yourself, if there is sufficient motivation and sufficient encouragement from others, it can be done. And I don't know who's calling me, but I'll tell them they have to call me later because I'm busy. Yes. Any, Maybe they're calling you with a question. Oh, they may be calling me with a question? That means, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Oh, no, no, no. Then call, call me back in an hour. <laughs> okay. Here's another question for you from okay. um, somebody in the audience. Okay. Would you say that it was courage that gave you the ability to do what you did as a young man or desperation or intolerance or something else? And where did that come from? You almost named all of the things that were the motivating factors. In other words, was I happy in the environment that I was in, that I was born and reared in? Was I happy? in that I could not go in the front door of the theater. If I went to a theater, I had to go down a back alley and go in the back door. Was I happy that I could not go into a restaurant downtown and sit down at a lunch counter and get a hammer? Did those things disturb me, bother me when I was 10, 11, 12 years old? Yes, because I was one of those who would go to my parents, my mother, my father, and incidentally, my father at least had a year of education. He was a successful businessman in insurance. And my mother had not gone to college. I'll need to interject this because my mother said, I want to go back to college. Again, she wanted to be an example. She wanted for her children and her grandchildren to follow. But she said, I can't go until my youngest child is in school. In other words, I have a brother and a sister. My mother said, I will not go back to school until my sister, my sister, her youngest child, was in school. So when that sister of mine started sixth grade, my mother, with a high school diploma, enrolled in a college, Savannah State College. She would go to college during the summer months when regular school was out, and she would teach during the regular school year. 20 years later, she got her college degree. Mm -hmm. Now tell me, does that motivate you, her children, those who see this lady, moderate, three children, working husband, and she says, I want to get a college education. And she succeeded in doing it, did not use as an excuse, but I got three children to raise. I got a husband to take care of. She did it. And if I needed an example of how you can get that education, notwithstanding conditions that you're in, lack of opportunity, you can get it. Now, let me say this. If you don't get anything else out of what I say, I want you to recognize the two most important things in the United States. One of them is economics, that is money. Number, <laughs> number two, I hate to say it, but it's politics. I am pleased I'm telling you that I have been given encouragement to go further for the next generation because of what is happening in America today, at least up until the 6th of January. And let's try to put that aside 
and hope nothing like that ever happens again. But if you have noticed, those of you who watch the news, there are more blacks now who are mayors, members of the Senate, members of the House, president, vice president. I'm saying that blacks now are in political positions so where you can say laws begin in your neighborhood. If there are going to be changes made, more educational opportunities, more economic opportunities, it's going to begin in your neighborhood. So in the scriptures, let down your bucket where you are. Let that be the motivating words for you as an individual. Take what you have and make the most of it. Nobody would have thought this crazy boy, William Anderson, who's cutting the necks off of chickens and cutting dogs open when he was 10 years old. Nobody was going to expect him to become president of a major medical organization. But he had enough people who were encouraging him. I have a great wife, by the way, who was willing to make all kinds of sacrifices so that we would be able to, first of all, take care of our family, but beyond that, look after those that follow the next generation. Speaking of that, um, there's a question here that asks, some folks have difficulty imagining what they will do after retirement. Your commitment to furthering <laughs> the next generation <laughs> seems like a wonderful inspiration toward how to deploy what's been gained through your career into contributing to upcoming professionals. What challenges have you encountered with contributing to the next generation? Well, let me let me say this. <laughs> I always have to uh, put my life in different chapters. <laughs> because let, uh, let me start after college. I graduated, incidentally, from Alabama State College for Negroes, and that was a sign on the bus that we traveled in, Alabama State College for Negroes. But out of that college came Rev. David Abernathy, Rosa Parks, and the pastor of the church in Montgomery, Martin Luther King Jr. Now, can you think of three better people to serve as the example, motivation. Rosa Parks was a seamstress. F. Ralph David Abernathy pastored a small church. Martin Luther King came out of a church and incidentally that same church that he came out of in Atlanta now has produced a black member of the United States Senate. So I'm saying that sometimes you have to identify with someone who has been where you were and look where they are now and you wonder how did they get there? And I can tell you this, while I grew up in a racist society, there were enough white people that saw in me something that could be helpful to them so that I could name them one by one all Whites are not racist. All blacks are not subjected to being prohibited from exercising whatever right they may have to get to where they want to be. Thus, look at where we are today. Mayors, governors, city council, vice president of the United States. So I'm saying that if I were to say anything that would encourage someone to continue, look at how far we have come. Now, mind you, it's been a long time. It's been over 100 years. But look where we are today and the opportunities that we have. And if we pass up those opportunities, we deserve to go back. Mind you, my father was born a slave. His mother was born and reared as a slave. I am a child of one who came here as a slave. 
So the next question, what um, led you to your association with MSU? I was active in the osteopath profession. I need to, I need to put in another little story. Why did I come to Detroit? I came to Detroit because there were more black DOs in the city of Detroit than any other city in the United States. Why? Because there were places where black DOs could practice hospital that they could use. There were no black specialists. But I saw the opportunities for myself and my family were more in the Michigan area than elsewhere. But it was the other people in Michigan, I'm talking about people who lived in the suburbs, lived in the rural areas, that did not have adequate access to doctors. They didn't. And so they were complaining to members of the legislature, say, there are no family doctors in our community, what are we supposed to do? Go 50 miles, uh, you know, to see a doctor, or I'm in labor and I gotta go 75 miles to get into the hospital that would deliver me, no, no. So I'm saying that the people were complaining to members of the legislature that we don't have any doctors. And the pressure then was on the legislature, but they didn't know how to do it. But the word got to some doctors, Frank McDevitt, Ray Godowski, I got to know them very well, Gene Sikorsky, they all dead now. But they said, we have to do something to give back to the communities that have helped us to become successful doctors. You got that? Some will sense, look, these people helped me, I need to do something to help them. So what they said was, we'll start an osteopathic school here. There were only six colleges of osteopathic medicine in the world. Today, they are 60. <laughs> so they said, we'll have to do something and let's start a school. Members of the legislature says, okay, we can support you in your effort to start a college of osteopathic medicine in Michigan, but we have a stipulation. It must be affiliated with one of the colleges. Michigan State opened its arms and said, come on in. We'd love to have a college of osteopathic medicine. And it has grown to be number one in the osteopathic profession. Two of my children followed, followed me. <laughs> yep, I have to start the school, yes. But then two of my children who decided they wanted to be physicians, where did they go? Michigan State. So the motivation was actually from the people that say, we need doctors, the kind of doctors that the osteopathic profession is producing. And we are producing more primary care physicians that were going into communities to practice family medicine. That's how the school started. The legislature said, we're gonna have it, but it's gonna be at one of the colleges that is affiliated with Michigan State. Hmm. To our good, our good fortune. Yes. So here's another question for you. There are several people who would like to know how to donate to your minority scholarship program. Easy, <laughs> easy. I'm happy for that. Michigan Osteopathic Foundation. You could go on your email, on your telephone, and call, if you just go to Michigan Osteopathic College, they will tell you how to. Michigan Osteopathic Foundation, just those are easy to remember. Michigan Osteopathic Foundation, then there's the American Osteopathic Foundation. The American Osteopathic Foundation, they just put on the check for minority scholarship. American Osteopathic Foundation, it's in Chicago, I say it's on your email or you can get it from me or call up the Mission Osteopathic College. It's listed. That's how you can get the money. Send it to me. I'll take care of it. <laughs> I send it to Claire and Claire will make sure I get it. 
if you want to make I will, definitely. You can email right. us and we'll make sure Dr. Anderson gets the message. Absolutely. Yes. And I'm going to tell you, I was I shocked when Oregon Osteopathic Foundation, and listen, if any of you have never been to Oregon, there are no black folks in Oregon. A few, a few. But no, we are not dedicated to just a single source like black, white, Asian. No, no, no. We will take care of the needs of any of them. If they are in our area, we take care of them. So osteopathic physicians, uh, they don't discriminate at all. We have a, a guest who joined a little late, um, missed all of your great stories about Albany, Georgia, but um, she is an alum of MSU and is a class, was a classmate of Gil Anderson. Oh, my son. Okay, my number one son, yes. <laughs> Okay. Of fact, my son, he was in, I, he was born, I think, in Albany. <laughs> <laughs> so you you clearly know him, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> See, here's another question. What has given you joy and a sense of well-being throughout your life? Right, let's, let's start with my children. Uh, I had uh, five children. They all got terminal degrees. When I say terminal, I mean they went as far as they needed to go to do what they needed to do or wanted to do. Three of them went into medicine, two of them into education, and one of them teaches at Kennesaw State University in Georgia. Now, let me say this. There were very few black doctors in the state of Georgia. <laughs> and to say there is a black physician, no, a black educator who is committed to teaching in one of the state schools was out of the extraordinary. If you go back 25 years, you didn't have that. So one of my daughters decided she was going to stay in education and she teaches at Kennesaw State. Another one of my daughters, of course, is uh, practicing. I said she is the university physician at Tuskegee University, historic Tuskegee University. One of my sons practices in Las Vegas. He doesn't gamble, <laughs> but he's a, he, he likes practicing in Las Vegas. One of my daughters, my eldest of the daughters, uh, was a librarian in Southfield, as a matter of fact, and she has now retired. I don't know why these people retire. I have no intention of retiring. That was the and, next question. Okay, when am I going to retire? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hope they write on my tombstone when I'm 110. <laughs> he saw his last patient or he taught his last student last week. <laughs> <laughs> and he's 110 years old. Uh, no, I, I do not look forward to retirement. I hear a lot of people say, I can't wait to retire. I got to retire. No, I love what I do. In other words, I practiced surgery for 25 years. That was my life's ambition. What do you do next now? Your life's ambition, and they won't let you do that anymore. When you pass 65, you better start looking for something else to do if you're a surgeon. So they can't do that. What could you do next? The next thing I do is help that next generation. That's why I became director of medical education at Detroit Medical Center. And eventually I was asked if I would be senior advisor to the Dean of the College of Osteopathic Medicine. And that's what I do and that's what I enjoy doing. And that's what I'm going to be doing the next 10 years. So, so your kids and your career give you joy. And my grandkids now, one of my great, one of my granddaughters is a third year osteopathic medical student. Got that? <laughs> And I mentioned, and she, mind you, I don't know what she's going to be, as a matter of fact, and why she chose 
Philadelphia College, I don't know, but that's all right. It's still a college of osteopathic medicine. But then my grandson, mind you, why he wanted to become a urological surgeon, I don't know, but he went so much further as a urological surgeon than anybody else in the field of urology. In other words, he does prostates with a computer. You know, you can hear me, uh, huh? <laughs> robotic. He does prostates robotically. Hmm. That was unheard of when I was coming through. In other words, am I proud of what my children have elected to do and do very well? Yes, I am. And my granddaughter, my granddaughter's an internist practicing in Tallahassee. She takes care of the good people in Florida. They all are not good people. <laughs> so Dr. Anderson, um, sadly, our, our time is coming to a close. Okay. Um, I do have, um, there's one last question here that maybe, maybe you can do in a minute's time, I'm not sure. But um, most of us have some sort of pithy statement, some words of advice that we give ourselves on a regular basis. One of mine is let it go, let it go, let it go. Do you have words of advice or a phrase or a saying that you can leave with us that you often tell yourself? If they do not remember anything else that I say, you have to put your energies where they will be most effective and beneficial to those that follow you. If you don't leave something behind of value, you may as well have stayed where you came from. Now, you, you can tell me where you came from. But what I'm saying is this. Two words, mind you. Economics and education. That's all you have to remember. Forget everything else I've said. Two words. Education and economics. And listen, people. They go hand in hand. If you have economics and don't have the education as to how and when to use it to help others and help generation, it's going to leave you. We're going to take it away from you. Education, if you don't know how to manage what you have, you're not going to keep it. So, Those are great words. Words. that's yeah. all. Huh? Two words. Economics, with. Education. E E E E E E E E. <laughs> now I, you know, I, I didn't go back to talk about how we came out of slavery. <laughs> you, you could you could regale us with stories forever, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, but well, it, it's one thing that has been a joy for me is to be talking with you. It's been it's been so great to have you with us. Um, thank you. Very special thank you to you, Dr. Anderson. And to everybody who has joined this presentation, this event, um, I think you're an inspiration to a lot of us and certainly exemplify all that Age Alive stands for. So thank you again for your stories. I am, before I, we close, I encourage everybody to stay on the line in the room during our brief intermission and reconvene shortly for our stellar research panel Ooh. featuring diverse, interesting, important aging related research being done by MSU faculty and students. Um, and I, I know you won't be disappointed. So the research panel is gonna begin promptly at 4.15. For okay. those of you that don't stay with us on behalf of Age Alive, we wish everyone lifelong well-being, and thank you for being with us. <laughs>